Good morning. Hi. Thank you all for coming to Angular University. So let's see. Can we switch to my slides? Is that something I need to do? No. Maybe. <laughs> A button. Awesome. I guessed right. OK, good. <clears throat> all right. So we're doing, hello, we're doing three major events this year. We did one back in March, NGConf. We're doing AngularU today. And we're going to do Angular Connect in London in the fall, October. And at each one of these, we want to give you a meaningful snapshot about what we've been up to. Because you know we do public meeting notes, and you can you know, watch GitHub, and, and we tweet about things. But I think it's really hard to bring it all together and figure out, well, how do I plan my year? And I think this is a really important year as we're planning the migration, Angular 1 to Angular 2. And we hope a lot of you come along with us. So one of the things we talked about, well, we talked about a lot of things back at ng-conf. And if you followed along, you know, we talked about, hey, we're going to actually support Angular 1 for the foreseeable future. We talked about some of the goals about Angular 2. In particular, we talked about how performance was one of our core goals, along with simplifying the framework, making it even more productive for you folks. But performance is really this core thing for us, that we wanted to build the fastest JavaScript framework available anywhere. And we talked a little bit about how when we looked around at the tools that we could use to measure ourselves, to find out, are we building the fastest thing available? We didn't really find the full suite that would give us high resolution into both performance numbers of a full sort of macro application and tell us the memory profile of the benchmarks we're using. So we built this thing called BenchPress, which interestingly, we had to build it in a way that it wasn't Angular specific. And you guys can use BenchPress, and you should, for your own applications and your own libraries and whatnot. And we did this so that we could actually benchmark different versions of Angular and even benchmark Angular against other solutions. And so this is a rehash, but we did this graph of a particular benchmark called DeepTree. And DeepTree is meant to simulate what one of your applications is going to behave like for a user. And if we look at the far left over there, what we call baseline, this is where we built this deep tree benchmark using hand-tooled JavaScript, using every trick we knew of to make it perform well. And we use that as sort of the unit that we compare against. Angular 1, this is actually Angular 1.3, is about maybe a little over eight times slower than the baseline. And so we're really trying to get Angular 2 as fast or faster than all of those tricks. We'll talk about how in a little bit. But so Angular 2 out of the box, the, the, the 3.1 number there, we can see we're, we're almost three times faster than Angular 1. And this is great. And what you can view this as is how fast does my application render for the first time for the user? Ang Angular loads with my templates and whatnot, and it renders, and that's how fast that is. The, a2 with the view pool, this is Angular 2, once your application is loaded, for all of those common operations like scrolling, creating new items in a repeater, switching between views, we're very close to the view pool. I hope we can get a, lot, a bit faster, and we'll talk about that at the end. Now, in addition to the raw performance, we're similarly, and we're actually even better on memory. So this is really important if you've got a very large desktop application or if you're building for mobile footprint, where you have much less memory at your disposal, Angular 2 is going to shine. And then lastly, we wanted to find out, well, how well does Angular 2 scale as my data set scales? And so for this virtual scrolling benchmark, we graph it as we increase the number of data bindings for the application. And you can see for Angular 1, as the performance, uh, the, the time taken goes up as we add more data bindings. Angular 2, you notice the line gets a whole lot flatter. So just out of the box, you get some enormous headroom. But there are maybe some cases where you've got very large data sets or very you know, constrained processors like in mobile. And we enable you to take advantage of either immutable data structures or observables like the Rx library, where you can choose to make all of your data model use this, or just parts of it. And you can mix and match as you like to increase the performance of your application to make sure it scales linearly, or sort of order one, as you add more data bindings. 
Okay, so we could have probably stopped there and have checked our box for performance. But this isn't the only part of the story. And we wanted to continue telling you what we've been working on. We've got a number of experiments going on. I'd like to bring Igor up, who's gonna to talk to us about other things we're doing. Thank you, Brad. Hi, guys. So as you can see, we're really focused on performance and getting performance right in Angular 2. But one thing I want you guys to remember is that performance is not a single checkbox. There isn't this like one weird trick that you need to follow and now all of a sudden the application is running fast. When we are looking at how we can make Angular applications faster, we need to consider a whole range of things. And what I'm gonna show you today is I'm gonna introduce you to three experiments we are conducting with other teams and members of the Angular community that are aiming to improve different aspects of performance. These are just experiments at the moment. They are not production ready, but they are already having big impact on the shape and architecture of the core framework. The first experiment is focused not only on making applications fast, but also on making them smooth. Smooth applications are the ones that allow us to interact with them even while the application is busy creating views and doing a whole lot of work in the background. If you ever interacted with an application where you tried to scroll and it would just would ignore your input, or if you observe some animations happening in your application and these applications were all choppy and uh, interrupted, this is not a good experience and we're trying to solve this problem. And the way we are thinking of solving this problem is by using web workers and Angular applications. Now, in order to understand why web, using web workers in applications is a big deal, we have to look under the hood of the browser and take a look at how applications, whether they are built with Angular or without, execute in the browser. So at the heart of each browser, there is something we call event loop. This is a routine that runs on the main thread associated with the application. And this is the place where all of the input events that are coming into the application are being processed. And basically every single line of your script uh, of, of the application has been executed in this event loop. There is only one main event loop for your application, and this event loop can process only one event at a time. So when there are many things happening in your application, these events have to be queued up and executed one at a time. This creates latency and bottlenecks, and this is when we see the unpleasant user experience that we are trying to avoid. In a typical app, Angular application, we actually have three entities trying to fight over this scarce resource. We have the application itself that is trying to do business logic, it's trying to fetch data, do data transformations and calculations. Then we have the framework itself. The framework is doing its internal bookkeeping, it's providing services to the application, it's doing things like model lifting or user checking to figure out what changed, and it also is doing DOM manipulation in order to update the view. Lastly, we have a browser also in this game. Browser is, needs to take all of the DOM mutations that the, the application or the framework have made and transform them into something that is visible to the user. In order to do this, it needs to recalculate the positions and the layout of the visible elements, and also needs to repaint anything that, I'm, that might have changed on the screen. Additionally, there are other things happening, like garbage, garbage collection, that might be a significant uh, factor in, uh, in uh, this race. So we were thinking about how could we utilize this main thread better? How could we get more performance out of this? And rather than trying to do crazy tricks with scheduling or priority, priorities uh, in the framework, we thought, what if we removed a bulk of the work off of the main thread, leaving it free to respond to user input and doing work on an on a alternative uh, uh, event loop. And this is where web workers come in play. Web workers allow us to get access to this alternative event loop. Um, and if we look at the hardware that our applications run on today, we see that this hardware is well suited to this model because it often has multiple cores that actually allow the browser to process this work in parallel, thus giving us um, even higher performance boost. Now, you might wonder, you know, these web workers and parallelization, it looks awesome and solves all the problems. Why are we not using it already? And the answer to that is that there are many restrictions that come with using web workers. 
One of them is that from the web worker context, we have no access to DOM. And if you look at our applications, we receive all of our inputs through DOM and render any kind of changes uh, to the user through DOM. So not having access to DOM in a web worker thread is kind of a big deal. Additionally, if the web worker wants to actually render something, the only way to do it is send a message to the main thread. And in order to do that, it needs to work with the main thread using a synchronous message passing protocol. Most of the applications we build today are actually based on synchronously responding to user events. And changing this communication to be asynchronous adds additional layer of complexity to applications. So for these reasons, most of the applications today are not using web workers to its full potential. And if they're using web workers at all, then they're offloading only bits and pieces of functionality into the web worker context. In Angular, we're thinking, you know, could we actually move the whole application into a web worker so that all of the business logic, all of the data fetching and processing is happening off of the main thread? And additionally, could we move the framework itself into the web worker so that all of the services that the framework provides as well as dirt checking doesn't run on the main thread? However, I mentioned that we don't have access to DOM. And this is a big deal for Angular because it needs to have access to DOM in order to do its work. So this observation led us towards one of the biggest changes, architectural changes, we've made to the framework in Angular 2 so far. And the change was that we actually split the framework into two pieces. We have a context, we have a part of Angular that is capable of running in web worker thread uh, without access to DOM. And we have a separate part that we called Angular Renderer that is capable of running in the main thread and work with the, the other part of the framework, even if this part is in a different context. This means that we need to be able to handle the asynchronous message passing protocol and shielding the application from this complexity so that the application doesn't need to worry about this. We've implemented most of the important pieces of this architecture already. And the early results we've seen in large applications that process a lot of data and rely on things that are like virtual scrolling are very positive. We see very good uh, improvements in user experience. We also noticed that this architecture is well suited for mobile devices and mobile applications where the requirements for low latency and high interactivity are even higher. So we are really excited about this change in Angular and uh, we are curious to see how you guys are going to use this in your applications. This was running Angular and Web Workers. Now let's talk about mobile, mobile devices and mobile applications. We've seen a major uh, uptake in the mobile web and mobile applications in general, whether we are talking about native applications or hybrid applications or, or mobile web applications. Angular 2 has this aspiration to be a great platform for building mobile applications. And even with Angular 1, we've seen many awesome mobile applications being built. And that was primarily thanks to solutions like Ionic and Monaco with Onsen UI. These solutions built on top of Angular 1 and allow us to create applications that are deployed to mobile devices in wrappers that uh, facilitate the integration with the, with the native platform and render the UI using web, web view. We expect that these solutions will get only better with Angular 2, where our focus on performance and reducing memory, memory overhead, and things like the web worker that I mentioned about can make a big difference. However, we also have to be realistic and acknowledge that while we can build many awesome applications with this architecture, there are some classes of applications that we can just use WebView for. Um, and these are the applications where we would like to tap into the potential of native components. We've seen that with uh, the separation of the Angular renderer, now things are um, decoupled within the framework. And this allows us to actually create alternative renderers. So even though Angular ships by default with the DOM renderer, and we expect this to be the primary target for most of the Angular applications, now we have a chance to actually add additional renderers that allow us to render into Android and iOS uh, presentation layers directly. Your application is still just a JavaScript application, but when, when it uh, creates the UI, this UI is actually native UI. 
To do this, we need two things. We need the framework that is capable of this, uh, of this kind of integration. We also need a solution that integrates the native environment with the JavaScript execution engine. This is not a trivial task. And rather than trying to reinvent the wheel here, we are collaborating with two other projects that have already pioneered this space. The first one is Telerik's native script. Native script is a project that was announced about a year ago. And it's a cross-platform framework for building JavaScript applications that target native devices. It provides the full breadth of native APIs directly to the JavaScript application, and even includes an abstraction layer that allows to write UI only once and then deploy it uh, natively to both Android and iOS. We've been collaborating with the native script team, and a couple months ago at Telerik's next conference, we uh, showed the first um, initial demos of what this integration could look like. Since then, we've been working on making this integration better, and we're excited where this is heading. The other project that we are working with is React Native. We've met with the React team a couple months ago, and when we discussed areas where we could collaborate, React Native came at the top of the list. We were wondering, you know, what could the integration between Angular and React Native look like? And, well, let me actually show you. So what I have here is an application. It's an application that shows a list of national parks that I would like to visit. What I can do is I can scroll within this list. I can take, take items off of the list. And I can take new ones uh, and add new ones. If you pay close attention, you'll notice that this application is running in an iOS simulator. On all of the components that I'm interacting with here are native components. This is done through React Native. And under the hood, we're actually running an Angular 2 application. Let me show you the code. So this is Angular 2 code. I'm not going to go too much into the detail. Mishko and other speakers today are going to show more um, bits and pieces of Angular 2. But I'll just show you the most important ones. This code is written in JavaScript in ES6 with a little bit of help of TypeScript. And the core of this application is this class that defines a component in Angular 2 application. The class has one field, items, which is initialized to a list of uh, parks. And additionally, we have two methods, submit and remove, that help us uh, uh, add more events, uh, add more items into the list and remove parks that we already visited. This class is annotated with some metadata. Um, we have some default properties and attributes that we are setting on the element just for, for layout and presentation purposes. But more importantly, we have a template associated with this component. Now, for this demo, the template is in line. You would probably have it in a separate file. But what is interesting is that in this template, we are able to use familiar concepts in Angular, like interpolation. And if you have seen the new syntax for the repeater in Angular 2, this is just like you would use it in an HTML uh, template. But rather than trying to repeat over HTML elements, in this case, we are repeating over views. Now, views are React Native components that are backed by uh, I, iOS uh, UI view. And we are really actually interacting with non-HTML elements here. So we have scroll view that allows us to do the scrolling. We have text field. And the cool thing is that we can use the powerful features that are built into the Angular's templating with these components that it wasn't really designed for, but it works really well with. So I'm really excited to see how we can reuse the learnings we've invested into, into learning Angular and reuse tooling that are available or will be available for Angular's templates. The demo uh, is also available on GitHub. Uh, you'll have access to all these links later, so you can check it out. Don't worry about it right now. So we've seen this big change um, that happened to Angular with the separation of the renderer that allows us to do many new things. And that kind of forces us to update the mental model about Angular. In the past, when I was trying to explain how Angular works, I would typically show that you and your application write a te template, which is DOM-based, um, and you provide declarative instructions as to how Angular should create views for your application. Angular takes these instructions and applies them to data. And the result of this transformation is that we generate a DOM-based view. In Angular 2, 
we have much more flexibility. As we've seen, not only can we target DOM, and as I said, we expect this to be still the main target uh, platform for Angular applications, but now we have the flexibility by using native script or React Native to also target native Android and iOS directly. Additionally, there are other potential uses for this kind of separation. Now we can render directly into Canvas, maybe WebGL, and I'm actually curious to see what you guys will come up with and how you'll be able to use this kind of flexibility in your applications. So we talked about web workers and uh, native uh, and mobiles. Let's talk about server-side. The server-side rendering in Angular has been one of the top requested features for a long time. When we looked at why people are requesting this feature, we analyzed, we came, it came down to like three reasons. It came down to having faster speed up time, uh, faster startup time in an application where the server side can pre-render static HTML that is shipped with the first request, which is displayed to the user, and then the user can start making decisions as to how they will interact with the application, even before application is fully bootstrapped. This can have significant impact in, on reducing the perceived latency of the application bootstrap. The other use case is search engine optimization. Even though Google's crawler uh, can now crawl and index most of the JavaScript applications, there are still use cases where other crawlers can do this. And for these, it would be really useful to have server-side rendering so we can improve uh, the crawlability and the indexability of these applications. And lastly, it's very common that people want to share links to the application, especially deep links. And for these um, social media sites, they need to create previews of the application. And uh, server-side rendering can really help in this area. I'm not going to go too much into technical details, but the separation of the renderer that we've done in Angular already can significantly help in this area. Combined with the view pool that Brad mentioned in some of the early benchmarks, we can create a solution that is very efficient when it comes to computational, uh, but also memory um, requirements. Jeff and Patrick, the other way around, Patrick and Jeff, um, are very passionate about this uh, area. And they've been working with us on the server-side rendering story. And they're actually going to do a technical deep dive tomorrow at 10.30 and invite you to come and, and see it. I'm really curious to see uh, what these guys are going to present. So to summarize, we're conducting three experiments in Angular that have a big impact on how the future applications are going to be built with Angular. We are focusing on smoothness, and we want to achieve this through parallelism and web workers. We also want to tap into the potential of native components to provide rich mobile experiences. And lastly, we want to speed up the initial startup time by using server-side rendering. And with that, I'll hand it over back to Brad. Thank you. Thanks, Igor. OK, so yes, I am super excited about Angular going from a wonderful web desktop experience to a cross-platform development environment. All right, so that's some of the stuff we've been up to. Since ng-conf, we actually didn't know that we were going to do this. Uh, it's kind of exciting when fun things like that happen. One of the things we have been talking about a lot, though, is languages. And since Angular's beginning, we've, we've always been really just focused on developer productivity. Last fall, we announced that we were actually going to move past the framework and actually into the realm of language itself to add features and idioms to make developing easier, faster, and work better for large teams, where we announced that we were going to build an extension to JavaScript called AtScript. And if you remember, AtScript added a couple things. It kind of brought together the next version of JavaScript, ECMAScript 6, plus annotations to do metadata on top of your application, and types, the way TypeScript had envisioned them. Well, the thing we announced back in March was that we were collaborating with the TypeScript team at Microsoft, and we were actually just going to merge these things. We actually did create AtScript, but man, are we relieved. We don't have to maintain a branch of a language. So since then, since March, we've actually converted all of Angular 2 to use this stack. And where I, I was talking about annotations earlier, we've actually been collaborating with the Ember team on the specification for ECMAScript 7 
It's called decorators, which does what annotations does, plus some other stuff. And so we use this entire stack, top to bottom in Angular 2. And we think it's great for you too. But we realize that some of you may have a different choice and have valid reasons to do so. And so what we really want to tell you is that in Angular 2, we're going to make it work great no matter what slice in this stack you decide to use. So if you decide to use today's JavaScript, ECMAScript 5, we're going to show you a nice syntax today that makes that possible. If you're going to go to use the next generation in ECMAScript 6 and use a transpiler, that will work great. We think that's even more productive using things like classes, error functions, built-in promises, and the module system. And then you can go all the way to types and decorators. And anywhere you go along this spectrum, you're going to have a good experience. So I'd actually like to invite Mishko up to give us a demo. Oh, I should mention, I know you, maybe, many, many of you may have questions. We're going to have 30 minutes or so of questions at the end. So write some down, have some good ones. But Mishko is going to come up, show us a little bit about the variations in languages you can use. Thank you, Brad. So what I'd like to show you is, oh, what I'd like to show you is um, how you might build an application in ECMAScript 5, then transition to ECMAScript uh, 6 using transpilers, and then all the way to TypeScript. And I also want to show a little bit about um, how to create forms and, um, and data binding. So the first thing we have here is we have just an app that all it says is loading. And you can see the code on the right-hand side. We are importing. Uh, Angular, and we're importing app.js, which is currently empty. And this is where we're going to bootstrap ourselves. So we're going to have Angular University Greeter. And as you can see, it just says loading. So what we're going to try to do is uh, load this HTML inside of the Greeter tag. Uh, this HTML simply says, hello, username. And if I click on it, the parentheses means there's a click event. If a click event occurs in this particular location, then I would like to call the greet method. So there's no code behind this. This is what we're going to try to implement. Now, the choices we have is we can start with ECMAScript 5. Uh, we can then go into transpiled languages. Uh, we can then go all the way to TypeScript. If you want to have type information, I think that's very useful for, for large teams. And, and finally, I want to do some login forms. And the reason I want to take you on this journey is I would like to see, I would like to show you how all of these pieces fit together. So let's start with ECMAScript 5, <coughs> which is the today's JavaScript. And so to do that, um, we are basically just going to create a function, greet. Uh, now notice how the IDE is actually helping me here. Um, so let's just say user is world. And when I type greet dot, notice that it knows that one of the things I can bind to is annotations. Now, now how can that be? This is JavaScript, ECMAScript 5, right? That's because I'm using an, uh, an editor, an IDE, that understands uh, TypeScript definition files. So there's a, a DTS files, and it contains information about what the types are. Now, these are not types that you have to write as a user. These are the types that we have written for you, uh, and we shipped with Angular. So if you use an IDE that understands them, and there are many IDEs on the market. This is from Microsoft, called Visual Code. Uh, WebStorm is another IDE. If you use a Sublime, there's a plugin. Uh, so this is pretty uh, well supported in the, in the ecosystem today. So notice it knows about annotations. And we have to place two annotations on, uh, on, on here. So first is we have to tell Angular that it is a component. And again, notice how the ID is helping us, saying like there's a component annotation here, which takes an argument. And the argument is going to be the selector. And in this case, we are saying that the AU element, uh, so the Angular University Greeter element, should be selected. And the second annotation is we have to say what uh, is the, um, the template location. And again, notice that at every point along the way, the ID is helping us a lot. Now, keep in mind that this is pure JavaScript 5, right? This is no transpilers are necessary or anything of that sort. Now, the last step we have to do after we have defined the greeter class now is if you, if you look at this, this is essentially from Angular 1x, this is essentially the linking function, right, which sets up the scope information, is we have to bootstrap ourselves. And so from ng.bootstrap, notice again, help, uh, we can provide the greeter.
And now if we refresh, oops, reader, I typos. Okay, so now if we refresh, we see that A All right. See, it's, it's for real. It's, I'm not making stuff up here. All right. Now, if I click on the hello world, you see that there is, a, there is an error on the bottom that says, hey, you didn't define the greet method. Right, we forgot about that. So let's go back. And the way you do this in, in, um, uh, in, in um, JavaScript 5 is you do prototype.greet equals function. And let's just say alert. Um, hello, this that user exclamation point, right? So this is this standard way of declaring classes and prototype inheritance and so on. And so now if I click on it, it says hello world. Now this is kind of a, I, I think this is idiomatic JavaScript, but it's a bit cumbersome. So what can we do to make it better? So you're certainly welcome to retrocode this in this particular way, but we think we have a slightly better syntax. And the, the reason for the syntax will become a little more apparent once we talk about uh, ECMAScript 6. But let's just do the new syntax. So the new syntax is var greeter, and we place the annotations here. And we'll say that we have a component, and then we say we have a view and we have a class. And let's just move some of this code inside of it. So this is the constructor. And this is the greet method. And we have to have a comma right here. Okay, so this syntax is the, um, the one which we think is going to be closer to the way we're going to write code in the future, and we'll show you in a second. Uh, and again, it still works. Now, the reason we, we are, I'm, I'm recommending this particular syntax is that notice what's going to happen in the next step. So, so next step is what if we choose to use ECMAScript 6? So ECMAScript 6 has classes, but there is no... Uh, as classes and modules, but there's no IDE, rather there's no browser that supports e ECMAScripts out of the box, and so you're going to have to use one of the transpilers. Your choices of transpilers are really Tracer, uh, TypeScript, or Babel. And it turns out that all of these transpilers not only support ECMAScript 6, but they also support decorators uh, today. And so let's rewrite this in the ECMAScript 6 format um, to kind of compare how this would look like. So we would say at ng component. Let me just uninvent. And so now it's kind of becoming obvious why we chose that particular syntax for writing it in NES5. I am constantly misspelling things, am I not? <laughs> okay, so we have a constructor. And we have our greet. And let's see. And all right. So now we have this in, in uh, oops, but I, in order to bootstrap myself, I actually have to do a slightly different way of, of having index.html. And right, and now it complains that it doesn't know what ng is. And the reason for that is because ECMAScript 6 comes from the module import system as well. So let's import. Um, uh, ng namespace from and that right so now we can, we're back in business and we we can work this now import systems are important because they allow you to scale your applications you know in in um, Angular 1x or rather in ECMAScript 5 uh, as the application gets bigger and bigger there's more and more files that you have to include inside of the script tag and it kind of gets cumbersome where everything is coming from. And so module systems in ECMAScript 6 fixes this particular problem. Um, OK, so the next step would be, let's say we would like to import a form. So this is the form that we have. 
And let's imagine uh, what we have in here is we have an input. Uh, there's the input is username and password. We also have labels for it. And there's this thing called an MD input container. And we're only adding it here to kind of show off the material design that we're working on in Angular 2. Angular 1x also has material design that we ship with. And so we would like to have it for Angular 2 as well. So let's say we would like to include this particular uh, login component inside of the greeter. So how do we do that? So let's go back to uh, our code. And let's, uh, well, so first of all, let's go back to um, the HTML. And let's import AU login. So this is the, this we like to instantiate it here, but we have to tell the system about it. So let's first import a, a material design. And we can now create a component. And this will be the selector for it would be um, a u login. And let's give it an annotation for the view where the template is going to be found. And this one's going to be template URL. login.html. And now we can declare a login component. Now, login component will probably have a username. And this is where we can use TypeScript type information. We can say, well, we can specify that it's going to be a string that's going to help your, uh, you know, in a large scale project, this might be helpful. This is totally optional. You don't have to do that. And let's initialize this to my name. And let's also declare a password. That's also a string. And we're going to have to have a login method, which I'm going to fill in later. Now, in order to use it, we have to say that this guy imports it. OK, so at this point, we should have all the pieces necessary to have the form in here. Um, the thing that is not working is that we don't have styling, so let's pull that in as well. So we are going to have to work with forms. So from, from the uh, uh, Angular, we import the forms directive. And for material design, we're going to import the material design as well. And now it should be all pretty that with zoom zooms, et cetera. Now, one thing we're not having is that it would be really nice, as you can see, the username is blank. And it would be really nice to be able to bind this property to the username and also pre-bind it with the value, the initial value, which in this case is Mishko. So let's open up what is the login HTML look like. And the way we do this in Angular is we have this new syntax for binding to properties. An input has a property called value, and we can bind to it. What this says is that whenever the username property changes, please update the property, uh, the value property on the input as well. And so when I zoom in now, you can see that it's pre-bound. Now the next thing I would like to do is that I, as I type more, I would like to update the, 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 the property for, for in here as well. As you can see that we have this debug in here, which is kind of just easy to see what's happening under the hood. And it's not updating. The reason it's not updating is because uh, in Angular 2, data binding is one way. So to do that, we have to register some kind of an event. So input I mean, uh, produces a key up event, which we can listen to. And we can say username is uh, event.target.value. Uh, now this is very cumbersome, and we'll talk about this in a second. But this will actually fix the problem. So now the username, what? Username. Now, when I type, as you can see, it updates on the bottom as well. Now, this, as I said, this is cumbersome because there's a lot of typing, and it's not actually obvious that the value, which is the binding to the UI, and the event, which is the binding from the UI, uh, are related. And it's also not obvious that we have to go from event to target to value. So for that, we provide a, a directive called ng-model. And what ng-model does is it unifies the to the events, as well as the extraction of really, um, as well as the extraction of the of the data as well. So this kind of makes it unified uh, format. And so now when I type in 
uh, I still have the data binding, but it's really easier to follow what's going on. So that's what the directive does. Now there is one more trick we can do, and that is we can tell Angular like, look, whenever it turns out that these two ways of binding is so common in Angular 2 is that we have special syntax for it. So we can just say do both a event as well as a property binding and then we can just drop this particular portion over here. And now we can have full data binding in both directions, which looks like in both directions, um, for, for the username property. And we can do the same exact thing in here as well. Um, So we can see that that's bound and as well as the password is bound as well. So now let's work on this login button. So what we'd like to do is that when you click login, we would like to update the hello world with whatever the username happens to be up there. So to do that, let's go back to our code again. And we have to put some code in here. So let's say the first we would like to do is set up a a event emitter so that we can set up, uh, we can fire an event. So let's call it the success. And let's initialize that to ng.event emitter. Notice how nice it is to have your IDE help you with all the completions. So this, does, uh, let's say this does password is equal to, uh, let's say one, two, three. Then we can say this dot success. We can fire a success with, let's send in the username as well. So this simply says if the password is some magical number, then we can fire a success event uh, with the current username inside of it. So we can go to the greeter now. And in the greeter we can say, why don't you we listen to the success? And in that case we'll set the current user to the dollar event. And let's go back to up that TS. And the thing we also have to tell Angular is that there is such an event, so we can say events is success. So let's see. And as you can see, it's properly data bound. Now the thing is that we can actually do better. Remember this? This looks familiar, doesn't it? Well, that's, isn't that the same thing as just saying bracket in essence, we're saying there is kind of a reverse data binding going on in here. And so this is even a shorter syntax. So hopefully I have convinced you and I've taken you through a journey that you can use Angular 2 at any stage in time. You can choose to use it with ECMAScript 5. You can choose to use it with ECMAScript 6, even with TypeScript or any other start along the way. And I've also shown you how the DTS file actually makes the editing experience a lot more enjoyable because we can provide type information as in an error checking as you go along. All right, super cool. Yeah, so I, I'm, I think I'm really happy we made the decision to build in TypeScript so that even if you guys don't choose to use it for your own code, you can take advantage of it. Anybody else who's writing libraries out there, it's a good road. So for us, a lot of people ask me, hey, yes, Brad, when will Angular 2 be done? And I always say, I don't know, and I wish I did. Um, but what I wanted to do was give you a sense so you can follow along at home and understand the progress that we're making. So back in February, we announced this alpha release of Angular 2, where we started making bundles that you could kind of use. And then in March, we built a website preview at angular.io, where you could start to see some of the documentation for APIs and just a little bit of a quick start guide. So you can start getting your feet wet. Since then, internally at Google, we've actually started some migrations of large apps, teams of 100 folks or so, building on Angular 2 already. And we're doing this internally so that we know that Angular 2 is ready for you when we get all the way to beta and then beyond for our final release. And so the question is, well, well when, when will that be? We're not going to rush it, but we, like, we, are, we are working as quick as, as we can. But I wanted to give you, like I said, a way that you can follow along with what we're doing and kind of progress we're making. So next steps. If you look on GitHub, we actually do three weeks out sort of planning. And if you look at our next three milestones, 
they fit in this first box here that I'll call finishing the core. This is where we're taking all of the feedback we're getting from the internal apps porting to Angular 2 and from a couple select external folks like the Ionic framework team over at Drifty, uh, like uh, the folks doing the, the native script integration and a couple others. And so we're nearly done with that. After we've done the final core work, like you saw Mishko demonstrate this two-way binding syntax, or the, the nice form syntax with square brace, round brace. We're gonna do the same sort of sugaring, making sure that you guys are gonna be really productive on the Angular 2 APIs. After that, we actually think there's more room for performance. We think we've done great on those initial graphs that I showed you at the beginning, but we actually know there's some more room to get faster yet. And so we're gonna go through a performance improvement phase. In addition to a bunch of things we know we can improve, uh, Mishko and some other folks are busy putting the web tracing framework into Angular 2 so we can find even more areas for improvement. We're excited about that. And then lastly, we're gonna build a set of docs to make sure that full set of API docs, a great developer's guide is there so that you guys can be successful. Now, the other parts, there, there are some other parts going on. The focus of Angular 1.5 is to be migration. We're gonna, we've got a bunch of stuff on the table, and Pete is here from London. Pete works on the Angular 1 bits. Hi, Pete. And he's working on planning that Angular 1.5. There's gonna be features and other bug fixes, other improvements, but the, the core idea is how do we make it easy and shorten the gap from if I wanna to move to Angular 2, how can I make that gap as small as possible? And so we're working on APIs in Angular 1 that make it easier to match your code to Angular 2. Same thing in the Angular 2 framework. How do we make it easy to match your code to Angular 1? We're gonna look at some automated translation tools. We've already built some of these internally at Google. And we're gonna see which ones of those make sense to reflect out to you guys. And then guides to help you along in the process. Now like for Angular 1, we're porting the animation framework. We actually have some really cool new ideas. I and mean, if you've heard Matthias' talks lately, we've got this nice timeline-based animation idiom that we're gonna be bringing out. And this is gonna support the next generation of material design components. Mishko demonstrated a couple of them for, uh, in his demo today, but we're gonna bring along the whole suite that are, that's available in Angular 1 right now and make it available in Angular 2. Also, something we haven't talked much about, but you're gonna hear more about soon, is that we're building a command line interface for Angular projects. And we envision this to be sort of the core of the workflow, so that when I wanna start a new project and I wanna build a scaffold that's in what we recommend the, the right uh, development uh, structure is for your application files, can help you build it out, can help you pull in components from NPM, can help you build test scaffolding, and all of the other sort of repetitive work that's not fun to do manually. And then all the things that Igor talked about, server-side rendering native web workers. By the time we get to Angular Connect in the fall, I think we'll probably have some other surprises. We didn't plan to do anything in the blue boxes when we talked to you three months ago. So obviously there's some more room for surprises to come up. We're excited to do it. All right, we're done with the slides. Uh, Mishko and Igor, why don't you come on up? We're here to answer questions for the next 30 minutes or so. Here are the slides, you can get to the demos, all of the links there. And here are our Twitter handles. Please let us know if you don't get questions answered. And there's, wow, there's a guy with a question there over there. And um, Kevin's gonna run around, was it over there on the, the side? Yeah, question? Question, and I do want to remind folks, those of you who are standing, there's a bunch of seats up in the front. Uh, if you need a seat. Uh, what about uh, routing? I haven't heard any discussion on routing. Routing. Yeah, Igor has been working on routing with Brian and, uh, and Matthias. Yeah, so the, the microphone? Yeah. So the original plan for us was to have the route ready by the time Angular 1 uh, 4 shipped, but unfortunately we came across several glitches and it just wasn't ready, so we decided to pull it back in. Right now, we're working on the router in the Angular Angular repository, and you can follow the progress there. There's still some of the basic functionality that is broken, and that's why we are not showing it right now. 
But as soon as I get back from the conference, uh, it's uh, one of the top priority things on my list that I'm working on with Brian and Matthias right now. So, so what would be the, the, would UI router be the best, para closest paradigm to what you're, you're planning on doing or? Uh, yes, so we took some of the ideas from the UI router, simplified it a bunch, and uh, we added some more features that we think are very important for building large applications as well as some mobile applications. Um, additionally, we are looking into how to do lazy loading in the, uh, the router itself. So yes, if you, if you look at the UI router, if you're familiar with the UI router, many of the concepts that are built into the UI router will be present in the, this new routing. Thank you. Great. Uh, maybe right here, Kevin? So when you guys talked about the mobile stuff, um, what exactly is is like your build process? Are we still using PhoneGap with a web view? Like, are we? And I'm not familiar enough with React Native and NativeScript. You have to know how they're deploying. But like, what does that look like with the approach that you've outlined here? What does it look like from the developer's perspective? Um, are you still using PhoneGap? Are you still wrapping that up, or is it different? No, you kind of see a lie there. It's, no, we are not using Cordova. This is actually deploying directly. We, are, we have a native shell um, that is provided by the React uh, native itself. And into this shell, we're deploying the JavaScript application that then runs in the browser. So, so, using React so if you're native. deploying to iOS, you will use Xcode to develop it. Exactly. On, uh, on the native script solution, if you're on Windows, they actually have a web-based IDE, where you can actually deploy both to Android and iOS from one place. OK, so you're using the native script yeah. stuff. And, and this is okay. something that we're it. not <laughs> taking care of. This is provided to us by native script and React Native. OK. Yeah, That's but yeah, it doesn't use any Cordova. There's no web views. I mean, you can use web views if you want. But no, these use the native solutions. Good question. OK, back there. And, OK, all right. Hi, guys. Uh -oh. Hey, Ward. Hello. <laughs> Hey, uh, that ng model stuff is really uh, a nice move, I think, for those of us who've been very interested in two-way data binding. Uh, curious, though, how does it know what is the, va the equivalent of the value property, the data property of the uh, control, and what events it should be listening to? Because that could be different depending on what thing you're attaching it to, and I might create my own thing and want to emulate that ng model idea. So how does, you know, how does that work? So similarly to the way it works in Angular 1x, you know, if you're building a control that is meant to be used inside of a form, uh, you will probably have to interface with ng-model. Uh, this was specifically designed so that you could do that. Uh, so if you, for example, build, uh, I don't know, a date picker, uh, you might want to consider like, hey, I should really integrate with ng-model so that when a developer uses this particular date picker, uh, they can use that as well. Um, the events that you fire are typically the events that you would do for native code. I mean, not native, but like if you would write the code uh, by hand. So you would say, you know, get a hold of the element dot event listener, add event listener. And so whatever goes into the add event listener is the name of the event uh, that you would fire in there. Okay, we have a bunch. I guess you guys will keep in track. Okay, so, yeah. Um, since you know, Angular started, uh, it was all about testing. Um, what can you say a little bit about how uh, testing with Jasmine, such as maybe new matchers or protractor for end-to-end -end testing, how does that change in Angular 2? Yes, yeah, so we are big, big on testing. Like, you know, testing is part of a culture. And uh, actually, in many, in many aspects, uh, testing with Angular 2 becomes easier. Because many of these components, previously, when you wrote them as directives, they were co tightly coupled with DOM. With the separation that we have in Angular now, um, you often can get away with unit testing most of your components rather than having to use compiler and uh, uh, compile templates. Additionally, we are building support into Protractor so that you don't need to worry about, you know, how am I going to test my Angular 2 application? Protractor will just know how to do it. We have a, we have a part um, built into Angular that is a, we call it, testability service. And this is, the, this is the interface that Protractor uses to interface with Angular, regardless of what version it is. So you can have a single version of Protractor and it knows how to talk to Angular 1, it knows how to talk to Angular 2. Yeah, yeah I'd like to add to it a little bit, uh, which is that testing is kind of funny. Like, we do so much of it, we kind of forget that it's even there. 
it's kind of like a breathing, like you don't think about it, it just happens, right? So like it kind of surprised me that you asked that question because I'm like, oh yeah, testing, we should talk about it some more. <laughs> um, if anything, Angular 2 is even better in testing and the main reason for it is because so much of it has gotten moved into the declarative, uh, the annotations, and we make it even um, less likely, easier for you not to use the DOM. So the, the code you tend to write in Angular 2 is really, um, th there's just no DOM being present, which makes the testing so much easier. Uh, so you should have even uh, more fun or easier time testing. In forms in particular? In, in, just everywhere, you know, because we have to abstract away the, the DOM so that we can render it to other uh, targets as well, not just DOM itself. One thing we've been doing recently is working on some new syntax for WebDriver to make sure that that property binding is well supported in Protractor. Okay. There's one back there. The, the, this, I think it's go back there. That, that woman's been trying to. Okay. All right. Good. Okay. Go. Um, you mentioned mobile and Ionic. Um, so what Angular 2 is doing with that? Can you give more details about working with the web view and web workers? Yeah. Mishko has a weekly call with the Ionic folks. Right. So Ionic, uh, they're building Ionic version 2, I guess, uh, just like we're building Angular 2, and we're very close with them uh, to make sure that they can uh, are they here presenting, I think? I think so, so. so we've yeah. got actually some Ionic workshops that Terrence is going to give on Wednesday yes. and Thursday. And we do have extra seats in the Thursday session if anybody wants yeah, to. Yeah, we don't want to speak that. for Ionic folks. But we, we do fully support them. We've been having a good time trying to figure out what the right mediums for them are right. in Angular 2. And it's been great having them because they always come up with like some crazy um, use cases, which t turns out not to be crazy, we just didn't think about it, but it's glad to have them on board and, you know, they, them picking on those use cases. Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Oh. So I have a team that's writing a lot of new code in Angular, and I want to know what best practices would there be to make the migration to Angular 2 easier? Yeah. A couple things. We talked about this a little bit at ng-conf. Number one is we're, we need to assume a starting point where we're going to be building migration guides, migration tools, et cetera. And we've been working with John Papa on a style guide. And if you search for John Papa Angular style guide, that's what we expect everybody should be doing as far as structuring your Angular 1 code. It would also be advantageous to use TypeScript if you're into it because it makes refactoring easier. You saw some of the nice... Uh, code completion. We didn't show off refactoring too much, but that gets much easier uh, with TypeScript as well. You guys have other additionally options? just jumping onto ES6. It would be a good move. Like you get many of the benefits of just better productivity and uh, better expressiveness in your in your code. So we highly recommend starting to think about how you could start incorporating even just pieces. Not maybe not the whole ES6, but maybe just starting with a module system or classes or error functions uh, into your application. That that will help. I think with uh, the 1.5 release, which we're going to work on next in one, one branch, uh, I think we're going to focus many of these things and try to answer them, so we'll have a much better story for you guys. Yep. Who's next? Um, um, hi. Um, I was wondering if uh, you could elaborate on what the web component story is going to look like for Angular. So thinking about like Polymer, uh, are we going to get something similar for portable um, Angular directives? and then collaborate with others? Yeah. So Angular 2, we've designed from the beginning to work seamlessly with web components. And a lot of the way we designed the event system or the way we interact with components maps perfectly fine to web components by Polymer or by the Bricks folks on at Mozilla. There, there may be some performance differences. And if you want to work in the world of server-side rendering and separating between web workers. This is not something that has been anticipated by the web component standard yet. And so there may be, this is one of the reasons why we're building material design components directly in Angular and not just using you know, web component suites that are out there. Hi. Uh, uh, Igor talked about uh, separating Angular between a renderer and uh, uh, an Angular core part in web workers. How would the data loading from the server uh, go in such approach? 
Web workers are fully capable of fetching data from the server, so you can make XHI requests directly from the web worker, just like you would from the main context. So the application will just fetch data as it would usually do. All right. I, I thought it was through the DOM they would. Uh, would uh, load no, the data. it's it's the restrictions on the DOM are really on the part of the DOM that is directly associated with the presentation layer. So any kind of um, DOM manipulation that you need to do is not available. Um, for example, so like parsing of HTML or changing location directly from the web worker is restricted. All right, thank you. Yeah, I seem to be getting a reputation as the guy that asks annoying language questions during Angular conferences. Um, so in keeping with that, uh, that reputation, there are clearly so many advantages in terms of development speed, uh, maintainability, migration for working either in TypeScript or at least in ES 2015 but you're clearly working very hard to make it possible to go all the way back to, to ES5. Yet you've said evergreen browsers only for Angular 2. I'm curious what the motivation is for making it possible to do Angular 2 that far back. And are there any sacrifices being made in terms of architecture or even just your own development speed in order to make that happen? Yeah, I think, so you, you guys can chime in. One of the big use cases we have is to make sure that it's really easy to get started with Angular. And if we require that you have to have a tool chain, well, this puts the really easy to get started out the door. We, we can support things like CodePen and uh, other editors that would allow you to get going. But it's really nice to just be able to drop in the Angular library and all of a sudden my browser lights up in understanding of Angular. There's probably a lot of use cases for sort of casual development in, in this vein. And you know, if, if I'm very new to the JavaScript development, it's, it's a big piece of overhead that I don't want to, I don't want to go down. Maybe if I'm, in, I'm a designer and I want to build a high fidelity prototype, like I may not want to actually bite off all of the uh, complexity that comes with, oh, I have to install Node and, and all the rest of these things. The command line interface that we're going to be working on aims to solve some of that, and we really do want to get everybody uh, as far forward as we can. But a lot of it is really just how can we make Angular easier and support choices you guys want to make. It really comes down to that the, the audience of Angular developers is very, um, very wide. There are many different groups of developers that use Angular. And sometimes it even surprises me when I see, like, oh, I didn't think that um, somebody who's just a casual developer can be building, you know, these crazy applications with Angular. And to make it possible for these um, users to still keep on using Angular 2, we need to adjust the, the language uh, just slightly so that it's easier for them to get started. We expect that most of the big applications will be, will be developed with a tool chain um, available to them and uh, will be, the files will be processed. But for, as Brad mentioned, for casual hacking, sometimes it's useful to have this flexibility. And as far as design trade-offs, I don't know, Mishko, you've been working on it. I think it's a pretty lightweight shim that we would create. Yeah, I'm not sure there's any design trade-offs in this particular area. I, yeah. this, this is not driven by... Yeah, um, usually we approach this, this uh, particular category of problem as, you know, let's build the best thing possible and then see how we can use it in ES5. Mm -hmm. Over here. Yeah, looking at the roadmap out there, a lot of exciting development coming down the road, but from a product management point of view, it starts to smell a little bit of feature creep. How do you decide what makes a cut for 2.0 and what gets deferred to 2.1? I would think of, it's a great question. We wrestle with this all the time. Like, why, how are we not trying to boil the ocean with every exciting thing that comes down at us? And some of it is that we're not going to make all of that required for calling it beta or final. So some of those tracks like server-side, native, et cetera, we're going to let those progress. The other part is we're actually not on the core team doing all of it. We made this architectural rendering split, which enabled a lot of other folks to help us. Native script team, um, Jeff and Patrick helping us on the server-side rendering. And we actually hope more other, other people jump in and help with other renderers as well. Uh, we probably won't tackle them, but I think this opens the platform up to a lot of possibilities. Um, most of it is driven by what we see people doing in Angular 1 today and what we think they're going to need to have an even greater future in Angular 2. So you guys can tell us if we're focusing on the wrong things. Please come up later and we can have a deep discussion. 
<laughs> also, we've been thinking about it, like web workers, we've been thinking about this for a long time, even before ng-conf, but we were just not sure, you know, what kind of impact this would have on the core of the framework. And we knew that if we wanted to do this, we need to get in, in early on, because if we just created a beta or Angular 2 release and then decided, oh, let's try to use web workers, we would be making major breaking changes. So that's why we're looking at all these different uh, experiments and see, you know, how quickly can we learn from these and adjust the core so that it's uh, suitable for this uh, path forward in the long term? So no one ever mentions Flux architecture during the Angular 2 stuff, and the more I look at it, I may be off base, but it seems like with one-way data binding, with the component-driven design, all these things, that it, flux architecture maps really well to Angular 2. Is that an accurate statement? And if so, are we kind of seeing, you know, the genesis of maybe the death of MVC in the front end with Angular 2? I, I think it's an accurate statement, but I wouldn't go as far as saying it's a death of MVC. I was just being dramatic. Uh, <laughs> you, you can be dramatic. That's perfectly fine. Uh, I think there are many different approaches. Um, the Flux architecture is nice, but there are there is overhead in terms of the mental model and the, what you have to follow and the rules, et cetera. And so they're not necessarily, um, those benefits aren't necessarily justifying the cost in every single situation. In many situations, they do. And so what we're more interested in is making sure that you have a wide spectrum of choices in how you can approach this particular problem and then use the best hammer for the particular job. It's actually cool. I mean, there's alignment across the industry. I think Ember has a similar architecture in this respect. And it's actually allowed us to collaborate with folks in the React team who are very smart, and we really enjoy working with them. So it's pretty cool. Uh, I'm only 10 years old, and I want to know if Angular 2 will be easier than Angular 1. Wow. <laughs> that's, that's my that's, boy. That's a great question. <laughs> And I think that sets Mishko up well. Yes, I. I want to know the same thing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we have done many things to simplify things in Angular 2. And one way to measure that is that you can see a significant decrease in the number of, of directives that are required to kind of get an application going. Um, that I think speaks to the, the simplicity of it. You know, we have really one kind, two kinds of uh, binding syntax. You know, binding for properties going to the UI and binding for events, which is the data coming out of the UI. And so, uh, it's a lot more predictable. It's a lot easier to reason about, and you have to actually know fewer things. I know it may not seem like way coming from from Angular 1x, but many things I, I think are simplified. So I really do hope that it will be easier for, whether you're 10 year old or 35 year old, easier to pick up and use. All right, great to have you guys here. Um, so my big question is, uh, when it comes to modules, one of the challenges I know I've found is, personally, uh, from personal experience here, is what's the best technique you recommend for knowing you know, what to import in Angular 2 and things like that? I know, for instance, you have some, uh, I'll call them container modules, you know, that contain other modules. Um, but what do you recommend there? You know, I know the docs eventually will catch up and all that. But for today, if somebody wants to get started, what would you say to do there? Yeah, we have a lot of work to do over there to kind of uh, make it uh, simplified. The goal is, the, the end goal, the target we're heading for, is that you should always import from Angular 2. Like there should be but one import that you do. Uh, and you can import, uh, as I did in a demo, where you say import star as ng, or you can actually import the individual components directly from it. But you should always be importing from Angular 2. Um, currently, that might not be the case, because you know, we're just in, in the process of getting there. Uh, but that's the goal. Excellent, excellent. Yeah. And when it comes to IDs, we're actually, you know, using, on, on the team, we're pretty much using all of them that are available. Um, <laughs> we see that various IDs have uh, various strengths and weaknesses, especially when it comes to TypeScript integration. For example, I use WebStorm quite a bit, but I see that the, the TypeScript integration is not quite there yet. And I know that they're working on it, but uh, compared to Microsoft's uh, visual code, um, the TypeScript support is there, much better there. 
But at the same time, when I try to use vi uh, visual code, I saw like, you know, there are some features that are still missing and I would still prefer to go to WebStorm. Um, other people have similar feelings about uh, Sublime and, and uh, other editors. So I think the landscape there is still forming. There's still a lot of area for improvement. Uh, but we see that it's improving with uh, every month as the new releases are coming out. You know, I'd also like to add that Angular 2 syntax is, we, when we were designing it, we really thought about how would it help the ID, uh, the tooling story, so that because it's more predictable, it's easier to reason about, the, these IDEs will be able to provide a lot more useful hints and you know, fill-ins, et cetera. So I think you, you will see over the next coming months as the IDs kind of pick up all this stuff, uh, even more useful completions and so on. In addition to that, we're as part of the sugaring phase, we're going to bake in a lot more help for the developer. So if you forgot to include the right thing, we're going to tell you. And this is something we've actually started on right now. That's right. Uh, I have a question about the, the glue language. It seems that in the uh, Angular 1, the glue language is the HTML templates. And to me, it seems that in Angular 2, uh, you take it out in a way and you put the, the glue language uh, into JavaScript, am, am I right? Or if you move into the components, the most important thing becomes the glue language. How, how do you glue the, the components uh, together? So am I right about understanding that you, you anticipate that people will use less the HTML templates, the Angular templates, and more in JavaScript glue the, the components? I don't think there is less of it. I think that the, the, the mixture is about the same between HTML and JavaScript that it was in Angular 1 versus Angular 2. Um, if anything, there is probably slightly less JavaScript because things like directive definition objects got simplified and they do a lot more tricks for you. Uh, but I wouldn't say there is any less of HTML. You know, any kind of syntax that we had in Angular 1x for expressing something in HTML, there is an equivalent syntax in Angular 2. Maybe one of the things you're noticing is in ES6, for very short templates, we can inline them, uh, which is nice. It's nice for demos, because I can put it all in line. But we expect for real projects, your template will still exist in an HTML file that you can get validation help on, that you know, your designers can work on, that we can still preserve that nice separation of my template from my imperative code. All right, thank you. Um, my name is Terry, I'm with uh, Walmart Technology. And first, I just wanna thank you guys for really helping push the web forward. Um, this is really good stuff. Uh, and the way you're doing that is taking a stance on uh, uh, older technology uh, needs to go to the past, right? So I'm not gonna call anything out in particular. That's a big deal in a very large enterprise uh, setting, and so it's very it's helped me. So I just wanted to let you know that. Also, uh, I want to hear. I, I got a topic request. Um, I want to hear more about the ways of working that you guys are doing. You touch on it with the tools that you're building. Um, you you've held open forums when you have uh, sprint meetings and stuff. So I. I I love that. I'd like to hear more about how you're working with internal teams and helping them to migrate to uh, uh, Angular 2. And so that's kind of my question is, where can I get more information about what's happening internally now? Because um, I've got plans to make now, so thank okay. you. You can get hired at Google, then you can see a little content. Wow. <laughs> okay, I can, I can actually talk about this a little bit. Kevin, did you want to say something? No, 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 go ahead. Okay, so I actually manage one of these teams of about 100 folks that's, got, that's already migrating to Angular 2. And it's nice because we sit in the same building with the Angular team, so we can make use of that. But we know that's not going to be true for most folks. So we're building this as a learning experience where, okay, well, maybe it's kind of rough for my team, but it should be very easy for you guys. And the process has been we've taken a survey of our Angular 1 application, and we've looked at all of the sort of design idioms that we use and mapped them from Angular 1 into Angular 2. And we use that information actually to figure out some of the things we can automatically map, like the templates. A lot of the templates are automatically mappable from Angular 1 to Angular 2. Some of the things 
are partially mappable and just we put in a comment say, hey, some human needs to fix this thing. And we've actually, we've enumerated all of the directives we use and then all of the places we use things that kind of go away or, may, or become much easier in Angular 2, like in Angular 2 we don't have to use dollar sign watch. Um, we don't, there's no scope, dollar sign scope goes away in Angular 2. And so we enumerate all of those places and you know, we find, well, we designed 300 components and we know we're gonna need to port those. And you know, there's all these other code sites we know we're gonna need to idiomatically move. And we built a, you know, a Gantt chart, but sort of a feature set so that we can distribute the work and track progress. And beyond that, it's been a lot of sort of rinse and repeat with the Angular team about, well, does this sort of idiom exist in Angular 2? Oh, it doesn't, we'll go build it. So good news is my, my team, called Green Tea, is actually doing a lot of that for you. And hopefully, you run into very little by the time you guys get to it. Any more, any more questions? Oh, we got one in the front. It's the most running I've done in okay. months. <laughs> Kids can't run this far. Hi, my name is Stefan. I'm from Tremor Video. And uh, my goal coming here is to be the Angular evangelist and try to figure out a way, uh, if it's possible, for, we, for us to use Angular in our application. Let me explain what we do briefly. We write, uh, um, we have, we're a big advertising company, and we design an SDK where people who write native Android and iOS applications call our Android library or our iOS library, and then it will play our advertisements that have very complex animations. Is there a way that we could write an adapter pattern so that uh, they can plug into the back end of the core of the animation would no longer be written in native Java or Objective-C, but it would be written in Angular? I'm glad you asked. Uh, <laughs> So, so the, the next version of our animation um, is actually much more declarative than the first one is. And we actually have some hope, we have no proof, but we have some hope that we can port that style of animations and move it into the template, make it a, you know, completely a template concern that ties into your code states at the right points. But in a way so that we could actually port the animation framework to both an, uh, iOS and Android to allow you to have the same sort of facilities, whether I'm on desktop, mobile web, or Android iOS. We haven't really started the work on it, except sort of in very sketch form, um, but we have high hope. Hi, my name is Chiranjeev. I'm working in Aruba Networks. So my question is, uh, when we migrate to Angular 2, Will you have facility to migrate module-wise? Like one module can work on Angular 1x, another one in Angular 2? So in, in the, the, the idea, yes, is that the new router, if you use it in Angular 1, will allow you to mix and match views. So that one view may be composed via Angular 1, and another view may be composed in Angular 2. And this is, this is work that we're currently um, building right now. One of the challenges will be that you'll actually need to port the directives. If you have shared directives between, across your application, you, know, you want them to kind of look the same when you switch from one view to another. A text field should look like a text field, whether it's an Angular 1 or Angular 2. So some of the work you'll have to do in porting, but yes, that's the idea, is that you'll be able to mix and match within an application. So if you want to minimize downtime for your developers in building the app, it should be possible. You go, we have one here. Hey guys, my name is Hunter, I'm from Hightail. Uh, so we write a lot of attribute directives that focus on some type of specific or general reusable DOM manipulation. Um, where does that kind of sit and where do those, those directives sit in the rendering cycle that you guys are talking about? Mishko, you wanna talk about how directives? Uh, I missed the- Attribute directives. Uh, in Angular 2. So just like uh, one, one of the changes we made in Angular 2 is that we have a concept of component. Whereas in Angular 1, there was directives and you would be able to write all kinds of directives. Generally, they all fall into three categories and really only two of them are widely used in applications. One is uh, the component directives and the other one are reusable attribute directives like the ones you mentioned. We have this concept in Angular uh, 2 as well. Um, besides just writing these general components so with the component annotation, you can also create um, 
directives where you just use add directive and it behaves just like the attribute directive that you used to. Do those get rendered? Um, do those also work in the web worker, but they don't have access to DOM? Do, do some of them get rendered on I the see. other side? So with web workers, we actually, you, you need to be able to do that work um, for most of these, if, the, if these attribute directives are actually doing uh, presentation logic, they need to execute on the main thread. And we have an API that allows to create these uh, custom views on the main thread and interact with the rest of the application through the framework. Cool, thanks. Yeah, hi. Uh, we are starting off with an Angular 1.4 app, and we were considering to move to TypeScript just to be prepared uh, to make the migration easier to Angular 2. Mm -hmm. And do you think it's wise to wait until 1.5 is out, uh, or like it doesn't really matter in that? Angular 1.5? Yes. No, no. Sh should he wait until TypeScript 1.5 is out, or should he adopt oh. now for Angular 1? Um. TypeScript 1.5 beta has one feature that you might be interested in, which is the decorator support, which allows you to express the metadata. Uh, Actually, so, I meant I, if until Angular 1.5 is out, not okay. TypeScript. So in that case, you can totally start with 1.4, which is a stable code base. Uh, the DTS file for Angular 1 is uh, on uh, uh, definitely typed. So you can definitely start there. And it's probably better than, than trying to work with the beta version of TypeScript. Hi, um, just curious about some of the module stuff you were showing. It seems that as uh, we move towards Angular 2, more and more of us will be writing uh, using modules and loading modules asynchronously. Do you have any advice today about what we should use in terms of a module loader and how that stuff will impact our tool chain as uh, large app developers uh, in terms of you know how much how modular we should be writing things and how much file concatenation? What we should be doing and stuff like that. Thanks. So uh, keep in mind that the module system is part of ECMAScript 6, so it is not something that Angular is inventing. Rather, it is something that we think is the future, and we would like to be compatible in this particular way. Having said that, um, there are many different kind of competing ways that you can load modules. Uh, there are system.js, require, AMD. Uh, but I think most of them these days, like system.js, seems to be the thing that it seems to be able to load just about everything you want. Mm -hmm. There's a separate problem of, of con concatenating the files into a single um, kind of executable so you don't have to do asynchronous code uh, on the fly. That one is kind of solved, but I think it needs more work. But again, this is not Angular specific. This is just like the community. Uh, thing and I think we will be focusing on a way of, of repackaging as well because I think we need that for ourselves. So something is going to happen in this stage. Uh, as of right now, I think System JS is probably the best bet, but like, who knows? Cool. So how about a big round of applause for these three guys? An amazing keynote. <laughs> <laughs>